Episode 74, Church History, Part 30. In the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Christian Church had a split, and from the split came the Protestant Christian Church, birthing the Reformation, religions of Humanism, Lutheranism, Ulrich Swingley's theology, and a Baptist, also known as the Baptist, and Calvinism. But along with the Protestant Reformation of different religions, England was also going through a Reformation. Spiel Vogel in Reformation and Religious Warfare in the 16th century states, the English Reformation was initiated by King Henry VIII, who wanted to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, because she had failed to produce a male heir. Furthermore, Henry had fallen in love with Anne Boleyn, a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine. Anne's unwillingness to be only the king's mistress and the king's desire to have a legitimate male heir made their marriage imperative. But the king's first marriage stood in the way. In 1527, Imperial Charles V and his army of German Protestants, along with some Spanish and Italian soldiers, sacked and looted the city of Rome. They were protesting against unpaid wages. Remember, the Protestant movement resulted in the violence as the converts were told it was okay to fight against those not doing the will of God. But who said the Protestants were doing the will of God? Uh, nobody but themselves. Historians record that the Reformation was a very violent period in Europe, with family and friends fighting each other in the war of religion. During the time of the sack, King Henry VIII tried to find a way to annul his marriage from wife Queen Catherine and marry his mistress, Anne Boleyn. She was the sister of one of his former mistresses, they say. But Charles V is the nephew of his wife, and King Henry didn't want any retaliations for what he was about to do. So Henry VIII went and asked Pope Clement for an annulment because his wife could not produce any male heirs for him. Pope Clement disagreed with Henry VIII's request for such an annulment, and this disagreement led Henry to initiate the English Reformation, separating the Church of England from papal authority. He appointed himself supreme head of the Church of England and dissolved convents and monasteries, for which he was excommunicated for. Henry is also known as the father of the Royal Navy, as he invested heavily in the Navy, increasing its size from a few to more than 50 ships and established the Navy Board. Per J.J. Scarris Brick book, Henry VIII, Side note, if they tell you there was no way they could transport our people in the Atlantic slave trade in ships that big, tell them they were making ships in the 16th century and in prior episodes, we learned Europe was making ships for a very long time. Thomas Kramer and Thomas Cromwell, advisors to Henry VIII, advised him to go ahead and get an annulment through England's own ecclesiastical courts. The most important step toward this goal was an act of parliament cutting off all appeals from the English church courts to Rome, a piece of legislation that essentially abolished papal authority in England. Henry no longer needed the Pope to obtain his annulment. He was now in a hurry to marry Anne Boleyn because she was pregnant, and he had already secretly married her in January 1530. And he wanted his heir to be legitimized. Wow. In May, as Archbishop of Canterbury and head of the highest ecclesiastical court in England, Thomas Kramer ruled that the king's marriage to Catherine was null and absolutely void, and then validated Henry's marriage to Anne. This is scandalous. At the beginning of June, Anne was crowned queen. Three months later, a child was born. But much to the king's disappointment, the baby was a girl, whom they named Elizabeth per Spiel Vogel. In 1534, the Acts of Supremacy was passed by Parliament, recognizing Henry, the king, status as head of the Church of England. The Acts of Supremacy were two acts passed by the Parliament that established the English monarchs as the head of the Church of England. The Act of Supremacy declared King Henry VIII and his successors as the supreme head of the Church, replacing the Pope. Though the change was political to annul Henry VIII's marriage, the Church of England, under Henry's control, continued to maintain Roman Catholic doctrines and sacraments, 
despite being separated from Rome. The Church of England was now free. Thus the name Anglican Ecclesia came to be. England was now the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church was free. Anglican is an adjective used to describe the people, institutions, and churches, as well as the liturgical traditions and theological concepts developed by the Church of England per the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church by Cross and Livingston. KeatonPreppers.org states, From the Anglican denomination sprang the Episcopalian arm, which is in full communion with the See of Canterbury and the Archbishop of Canterbury, the so-called first among equals within the Anglican movement. Glenn S. Sunshine, in his book, The Reformation of Armchair Theologians, states, As the head of the England church, Henry VIII took advantage of the change to close the monasteries and confiscate their property in the kingdom. Yet, in general, his preference was to stay Catholic in every way possible, except with himself as the head of the church. He savagely prosecuted and executed for treason anyone who expressed any doubts about his divorce. But at the same time, he also executed mainstream Protestants as heretics. When he was in a reforming mood, he tended toward Lutheranism as less extreme than reformed Protestantism. But he would eventually lurch toward Catholicism pretty quickly, turning his back on reforms he had only recently instituted. His heart just wasn't in it. But it wasn't his heart that was driving his religious policy. Henry VIII's actions resulted in a wave of Protestants known as the Harrison Exiles, leaving the kingdom, typically heading toward reformed territories in Europe. Henry VII, his father, had not involved Parliament in his affairs very much, but Henry VIII had turned to the Parliament during his reign for money, in particular for grants of subsidies to fund his wars. The dissolution of the monasteries provided a means to replenish the treasury, and as a result, the crown took possession of monastic lands worth 36 million pounds a year. For Alison Weir and Henry VIII, the king and his court. By 1539, Henry VIII owned so much property, especially from the monasteries he took. Historians believed he owned one-tenth of Britain. When Catholicism was banned in the region, Henry VIII was a reluctant Protestant, per Glenn S. Sunshine. In order for the Church of England to return to simplicity of the early church, people needed to understand the original meaning of scripture and the writings of the early church fathers. Because Erasmus, a humanist, thought that the standard Latin edition of the Bible, known as the Vulgate, contained errors. Thus, he edited the Greek text of the New Testament from the earliest available manuscripts and published it, along with a new Latin translation in 1516. Erasmus also wrote annotations, a detailed commentary on the Vulgate Bible itself. In his day, Erasmus' work on the New Testament was considered his most outstanding achievement, and Martin Luther himself would use Erasmus' work as the basis for the German translation of the New Testament per Spielvogel. KingdomPreppers.org states, The reason for the translation is that Rome had long used questionable Latin sources for its Bible translations, which rendered certain words according to Catholic doctrine rather than the original Hebrew concept. One important example is of the word metonia, which in the Greek means repentance and signifies a deep transformation of one's heart or mind and a spiritual conversion wrought by their conformity to the Creator. But the Latin equivalent in Latin text was changed or translated to do penance in Catholic translations. For instance, the Catholic Douay Rams Bible, based on the Latin Vulgate, still translates the Greek term metonia as the Latin word do penance in Luke 13 and 3. No, I say unto you, but unless you shall do penance, you shall all likewise perish. It should be repent, which means to turn away from, not to do penance, confess sins to a man. Well, Anne couldn't give Henry VIII a male heir. 
So he moved on to Jane Seymour, and finally she gave him a son named Prince Edward. But he was very sickly and frail, and sadly, Jane died right after his birth. So Henry VIII married a lot more women, but none could give him a male heir. He was stuck with frail Prince Edward from Jane, his daughter Mary from his previous wife Catherine, or Queen Catherine, and a daughter Elizabeth from his mistress, turned into wife Anne. In 1547, Henry VIII dies and Prince Edward inherits the throne at the age of nine. So this allowed Thomas Kramer, his father's advisor, to rule and he promoted the Protestant agenda. In 1549, the Book of Commons was published, which listed the prayer books used by the Anglican Communion. It was a product of the English Reformation and the split from Rome. There was no more Latin being used, but English was the formal language. In 1559, King Edward died and his sister Queen Mary took the throne. She was a devout Catholic and wanted to reverse the England Reformation and return back to the ways of Rome. The England Parliament disagreed with her and during her five-year reign, hundreds of dissenters who refused to convert from being a Protestant to Catholicism were burned at the stake. She even had Thomas Kramer, the Protestant advisor to her father, Henry, burned to death. Glenn S. Sunshine states, given that Henry had split with Rome so he could divorce Mary's mother, Mary didn't exactly have warm feelings toward being a Protestant. So she began to arrest, prosecute, and burn alive any Protestants she found, particularly clergy and other leaders. This earned her the nickname Bloody Mary, making her the only English monarch with a mixed drink named after her. The renewed persecution caused a new wave of exiles to leave the country known as the Marian Exiles. Many of these made their way to Geneva and learned Calvin's more radical approach to reform theology and practices. So when you order a Bloody Mary drink, this is where the name came from. And this persecution is why John Knox left and started the Presbyterian churches in Scotland. Queen Mary eventually married Philip II of Spain, the king who took the side of the Catholics against the Calvinists. Queen Mary died in 1563 with no heirs, so her sister Elizabeth became the queen. One of her first actions as the queen was to establish the English Protestant Church, of which she became a supreme governor. Queen Elizabeth's 39 articles were adopted as congressional statements of the Church of England to accept and respect the Protestants and the Catholics of the England Reformation. The articles were finalized in 1571 by the entire bishops and clergy of Canterbury, York, and London and were incorporated into the Book of Common's Prayer. KingdomPreppers.org states, Elizabeth, who was skilled at avoiding open religious conflict, initially saw great success with the enforcement of the articles, which mix Catholic traditions and Protestant thinking. But while much of England was happy with the outcome, those at the extreme ends of the spectrum were not pleased. Among the disgruntled were the Marian exiles who had been forced out of England during the reign of the previous queen. They returned to England when Elizabeth was on the throne and was not comfortable with the compromise she was making. And they cried out, seeking another reformation. These particular reformers came to be known as the Puritans and they were largely Presbyterian. Rebecca Fraser, in her book, The Mayflower, The Families, The Voyage, and The Founding of America, adds, Puritans were Protestants who believed the English Reformation had not gone far enough. The Elizabethan religious settlement returned the church in England from Roman Catholicism to Anglicanism, established by Henry VIII, her father. Anxious not to offend the population, many of whom had been disturbed by the Reformation in the first place, Elizabeth's government did not wish to make the new religious settlement too Protestant, but many of the English Protestant clergy had been driven out by the Catholic Queen Mary, now returned from Geneva, imbued with the ideas of important theologians of the 16th century, including Jean Calvin. Many of Elizabeth's chief ministers were Calvinists in points of doctrine, such as predestination. 
However, they took the position that the state must dictate the form of the church. Bishops were an essential part of that. But we learned that Calvinism believed the elders or the Presbyterians should control the church. So they just switch whenever it's necessary. Thus, there was a battle between Queen Elizabeth's government and the ways of the Puritans or Presbyterians. Puritans believed anyone not a Puritan were wrong or sinful, but Queen Elizabeth dismantled their efforts. She eventually died in 1603, and with no children, James, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Lord Darnley, James' parents were both the great-grandchildren of Henry VII, which made King James the great-great-grandson of Henry VII, and now King James was the king of England, Scotland, and Ireland. As he takes the throne, the Puritans or Presbyterians are still fighting Queen Elizabeth's compromise of accepting Protestants and Catholics. And even though King James was a Presbyterian monarch, he disagreed with the Puritan stance against Elizabeth's compromise. Rebecca Fraser states, James made it clear he would make them conform or I shall harry them out of the land or worse. Canons of 1604 enforced conformity. All those who rejected the faith and practices of the established church were automatically excommunicated. Puritan clergy must go before the courts of high commission to swear to these new canons or they would have to leave their parishes as being men unfit for the obstinance and contempt to occupy such places. And in the end, if you were Puritan, passionate about your religion, you left England. Otherwise, you faced imprisonment or death under King James. So King James persecuted those who didn't conform to the Church of England. And as a result, many Puritans left to find homes across the seas to land that didn't belong to them in the so-called New World. In 1604, a new translation of the Bible, which was a compilation of approved books commissioned by the Hampton Court Conference to resolve differences in different translations of the Bible being used. Thus, the authorized King James Version of the Bible was completed in 1611. Now we have more translation of scripture by the descendants of Japheth and Esau during a time of massive slave trading of ancient Hebrew Israelites and Moors across the globe. King James didn't die until 1625 and Truth Roars is still trying to find any data on whether he spoke out or condoned the slavery of Yah's chosen people. But just like all the other Protestant leaders discussed in prior episodes, their silence was their approval. Desmond Tutu perfectly stated, if you are neutral in the situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse would not appreciate your neutrality. Thus, Truth Roars concludes that even through a corrupt church and king translating scripture to produce flawed versions time and time again, we can still trust that Yah has left enough truth for us, Yah's chosen people, to find our way back to him. The European colonists and imperialists did use the scriptures to fight the religious wars after war after war and egregiously enslave and exploit Hebrew Israelites and transport us all over the globe away from our homeland with our beautiful language and culture decimated. We must still dig deep and trust in the Most High that John 1 and 1 is still true. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yah, and the Word was Yah. Matthew 24 and 35 is still true. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but Yah's words shall not pass away. Genesis 17 and 7 is still true. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, Israel, Yisaela, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto them, to be our Yah and to thy seed after thee. Yah will never leave us nor forsake us. We just have to return back to him. And just maybe Yah allowed these corrupt people to translate scripture in order for us 
to seek him, to make us seek him for the truth. There is still a lot of truth in the scriptures, including the Apocrypha, and we would trust in that. Salama. As we seek truth, please seek truth with us. Please send questions or comments to info at truthwars.com or come it here. We don't claim to know everything. We just seek the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that knows everything. Let truth roar. Let truth reign. Let truth speak. And let truth set you and your entire family free. Truth roars. Truth reigns. Truth speaks. Truth sets me free. Please see a podcast disclaimer at truthwars.com.